Welcome to our podcast, where we talk about the interesting, frustrating, and inspiring experiences we have as people with strongly held religious views working in corporate IT. We're not here to preach or teach you our religion. We're here to explore ways we make our career as IT professionals mesh, or at least not conflict, with our religious life. This is Technically Religious. What do you do when you've spent over a year posting a weekly commentary on how tech ideas and concepts relate to Jewish thought, and specifically the Torah reading for that week? You make a book, of course, and that's exactly how Torah and Tech came to be. And today on our podcast, we're going to talk about it. I'm Leon Adato, and the other voices you're going to hear on this episode are my partners in podcasting crime and the focus of today's episode. We've got Yechiel Kalmanson. Hello. And Ben Greenberg. Hello there. And you've both been on Technically Religious before, so you know how this works. We begin with shameless self-promotion. So, Ben, kick it off. Tell us a little bit about you and where people can find out more of your glorious good thinking and work. Okay, shamelessly. So I'm Ben Greenberg, and I'm a developer advocate at Vonage. And you can find me on Twitter at Rabbi Greenberg and or on my website at bengreenberg.dev. That's Greenberg with an E, not a U. And uh, and find me in general on the internet, bangreenberg.dev, dev.2, all over the place. And how do you identify religiously? Mostly identify as an Orthodox Jew. Yechiel, you're next. Well, I'm Yechiel Kalmanson again. Um, I'm usually a software engineer of VMware, currently taking family leave to be a full-time dad. You can find me on Twitter at Yechiel K. You could find my blog, rabbionrails.io. And like Ben, I identify as an Orthodox Jew. Great. And just to circle around... I'm Leon Adato. I'm a head geek at SolarWinds. Yes, that's my actual job title, and SolarWinds is neither solar nor wind. It's a software vendor that makes monitoring stuff because naming things is apparently hard. You can find me at, on the Twitters, as I like to say because it horrifies my children, at Leon Adato. You can also hear me pontificate about things both technical and religious on my blog, adatosystems.com. And I also, for the trifecta, identify as an Orthodox Jew. And if you're scribbling any of this down, stop it! Put your hands back on the steering wheel, pay attention to the road, listen, because we're going to have these things in our show notes, along with all the other links and ideas that we're going to mention in the next little bit. So you don't have to write it down. We've done the writing for you. Um, Now, normally we dive into our topic, but because the topic is a book, I'd like to go from shameless self-promotion to shameless book promotion. Can one of you please tell me where people can get their hands on a copy of Torah and Tech? For sure. Well, you can buy them and you can buy the book at most retailers at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads. Oh, Goodreads is not a retailer. Um, Pretty much anywhere where you can buy books. You can also read more about the book and about our newsletter on our website at torahandtech.dev. That's torahandtech.dev. So diving in, I think one of the first questions a lot of folks who are working in tech or religion have is what does it take to make a book? Like just talk about the process of getting this book together, getting it online, selling it, editing it, all the, you know, how was that process for you? It takes a lot of sleepless nights, right, Yechiel? For sure. Though, in all fairness, unlike other books where you sit and write, like this book is a little different. It's sort of, it's a compilation of a year's worth of weekly newsletters. So the sleepless nights were spread out over a year of Thursday nights when you realize at 10 o'clock, gosh, I didn't do the newsletter yet. So there, there was two things that we did when we, t- we decided, okay, we have this year of newsletter content. We want to turn it into a book. There were two things that we did almost at the exact same time. We took all the content of the year's newsletters and put it into one big Google Doc, which you can imagine, Leon, it's like a bit of a, of a messy document. And then we did the second thing, which was we direct messaged you on Twitter and said, how do we make a book? <laughs> those were the two things that we did once we had those. Yeah, because while we're on the subject, I do want to give a shout out. The idea to actually put this in the book came to me when I was helping Leon work on his book, uh, The Four Questions Every Monitoring Engineer Has Asked. Or- yeah. I hope I didn't butcher that. Um, Yeah, so over a year ago, Leon asked me to help him edit a book, which turned out to be just reading it and telling Leon how awesome it was. You are my rabbinic sensitivity reader, which I know it sounds like I'm making a joke, but it really was. I I am not a rabbi. Um, I've never been to yeshiva, and I was writing a book that was at least 50% 
Judaic content, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't talking out of my rear end sometimes, so I needed somebody who was like, yeah, no, see, that idea there? No, that's not a thing. Yeah. But, like I said, I ended up just rubber stamping it because it was pretty good as as Aww. was. You know, I forced myself to put comments just to justify the money you actually paid me for it, but it was good. <laughs> anyway. You sound so. like a city rabbinic <laughs> kosher supervisor in Israel. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Wow. Just joking. Okay. And some of exception. you will get that With joke. the exception of this book was actually kosher. But yeah, but working on that book and also hearing your the Technically Religious episode where you spoke about that book gave me the idea that, hey, we should maybe put this into a book. And I, I uh, reached out to Ben about the idea and he was all for it too. So when it was time to actually do it, when we got through a year, um, we reached out to Leon. And if anyone is thinking of writing a book, I think Leon might be able to squeeze you into his busy schedule. At this Not through volunteering your time. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no. I am. I mean, yeah. people who've been listening to this, pod- this podcast know that um, we are here for you. Whoever, whoever the we is and whoever the you are, we are here for you. So if that is something you want to know, I'm happy to talk to you about the process. Um, but I'm curious, did you, did you get an editor involved? I had a little bit of experience putting together a book before. I when I was in uh, working in the congregational Jewish world, both on campus and the synagogue, I put together a book when I was on campus, and I put together a book in the congregational world. And uh, they were both again self published, and uh, and I did everything. I edited my own uh, text. I made my own graphic design. I put together the manuscript. I, I did from A to Z, and this time around, I didn't want to do that again because I know that I'm not a good editor of my own content, and I know from experience the mistakes that I find, and unlike something in the digital space, it is much harder to edit a mistake once it's printed and in people's bookshelves, and there is it's much harder to put out a version 1.0.1. <laughs> kind of exactly. <laughs> Bug fixes are harder in hardcover or paperback copies. Yeah, they're uh, really difficult. Yeah. It's very difficult. So and patching becomes a very literal process. Very little process, like print it on another piece of paper and tape it onto the book. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So this time around, I really wanted to make sure that we had people with us who could help us, who were not so, uh, I want to say, privileged to the text, or who read it as such privileged readers as the ones who write it. It's people who look at it with a more critical eye, and so we did hire uh, people uh, to both edit all the text uh spelling grammar flow style and we actually work with somebody who specifically was not our rabbinic supervisor leon somebody who didn't have extensive jewish background or experience because one of the goals of the book for us is to be accessible to those without that background and so Mm. every time she raised a question what is that what is this how do i understand that it was a great moment to inflect and think about, well, how do we make that better? And how do we make that more accessible? And how do we make that more understandable? So that was a critical part of, of the work she brought to it as well. Um, yeah, so we, and then we hired somebody to help us with the graphic design and somebody to help us with the typescripting. Uh, typescripting? Typescripting? Type the setting. manuscripting? Type typesetting. Setting. Typescripting. My mind has been too much in typescripts <laughs> recently. With <laughs> typesetting. I'm like, Hashtag how do I define problems. the type of this book? But... It's a strongly typed book. It's a very strongly typed book. Yes, indeed. It's got a method signature for every chapter. Uh, that is uh, that was a bit of the process, and then of course they every one of them. I mean, were offered invaluable help, right? I think I was that, that's true, right? Yechiel. They all they made the book turn from a big, huge Google Doc with a year's worth of newsletter content into something that actually could be printed and made sense and looked and looks presentable so again for people listening thinking oh wait you know i haven't thought about making a book but maybe that's a thing so we're talking about um first of all doing the work of the work right writing the book in this case you divided the work into 52 easy to digest pieces um and just wrote a little bit of the book every week um i want to remind everybody that if you write ten thousand words a day you'll have a book and if you write two thousand words a day you'll have a book and if you write 50 words a day, you will have a book. Please do not think that there is some minimum requirement of word generation before you can have a book. Um, I, I'm a big believer that people who who do writing should understand how powerful it is and share it. So that's the first piece. The second piece, though, is that once you've done the work of the work and you have the book, 
Um, you got an outside editor. In this case, you got a fresh set of eyes to look at this and say, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. Um, can you clean that up? And, and that was your canary in the coal mine, so to speak. And also graphic design, which um, Precisely. is, I think, again, for a lot of us, it's like, well, what do you mean? I just want words on a page and there's a cover. There's, you know, you know, art inside the book always helps to illustrate a point. You know, how, how involved was the graphic designer for all that? Yeah, in our case, there's no graphics in the inside the book. Um, there's no pictures or anything or diagrams. Um, so it was just for the cover, I think, you know? Unless you're referring to the typesetting. It was just the cover. The typesetting was separate. That was a separate person who helped with us with that. But that also, by the way, people often don't think about those sorts of things. Like, what style do you want the words to come out as? What are the... Each font choice reflects a different sort of uh it's almost like an interior designer for a book you know like you're trying to think of what kind of vibe you want to send with the fonts you choose and then double for us on top of that was while well, the book is entirely mostly in english there are a few snippets in in hebrew which are translated at on the spot so no, as you don't understand hebrew you don't have to be stumped by that but then at the same time the what about font and type for uh, non-English characters and how do you present that in a primarily English book? These sorts of questions which I don't think I definitely, I didn't think about before we started engaging in it and it ends up being really a crucial part of it because if the presentation of the book isn't worthwhile, if someone doesn't enjoy holding the book and wants to read the book, they're not going to read the book. And then all your efforts are essentially for naught. Right. And, and I'll underscore another point is that, first of all, just the, the typesetting consistency, that chapter headings have to look the same all throughout the book, and they can't look the same as subheadings, and they can't look the same as whatever. They should be similar. And like you said, you know, good interior design means that, uh, you know, there's a theme that I know when I go from one room to another room, it, it doesn't feel jarring. But at the same time, I know I'm in a different place. I'm looking at a different thing. But also something that people don't think about is, uh, electronic publishing, that it's not just about the printed book. It's also when you're when you're doing an e-publishing, those font choices are critically important to the conversion into an e-book. That if you get it wrong, things things don't lay out correctly anymore, because the e-pub generator, whether you're talking about um, Amazon's Kindle. Uh, or uh, Smashwords Meat Grinder or whatever it is, really needs those font choices to be the same all the way through the book to know what it's doing. So having a typesetter who's aware of that and who can catch those little mistakes, say, I will tell you, it saves hours because I did it myself for the book and it was probably the most labor-intensive part of the entire book that I did yes. because I didn't know what I was doing. You, would you say it's more labor-intensive than the work of the work of actually writing the book? Yeah, it was. It was yeah. it was more put it this way, it was more error prone. Right. I had to go back and redo the conversion to the ebook probably almost a hundred times. Right. Before I finally was able to find my butt with both hands <laughs> and and get it done. So Sounds familiar. Yeah, it, it's it's really a big deal. Okay, so what else about the book creating process um was interesting to you or exciting to you or frustrating to you or whatever, you know? What stands out? I guess I will say don't come in with the expectation of, like, making a million dollars off it. Um, <laughs> Only half a million. Like, okay, if, especially if you're self-publishing, it's not an expensive process at all. Um, I think we got it under about $500. If we make that back, that'll be nice. If we make a little more, um, that'll be even nicer. But, yeah, I don't see this. Uh, I don't see us quitting our day jobs anytime soon over this. Uh, and I will second that. Uh, yeah, the four questions has not, in fact, uh, supplemented my income to the point where it can cover my mortgage or even Starbucks. And a year and a half later, uh, yeah, a year and a half later, it still hasn't paid for itself. So I, it's a labor of love. The next question I have for you, though, is we've talked about write it because you really have something you have to say. So what was it that you had to say? What is the thing that you couldn't live without having this book around to put it into the world. I think it for me, it's the same thing that 
the driving force behind the weekly newsletter, which is really the impetus for the book and the foundation of the book, which actually, Leon, if I can be as audacious, is also a bit of what your podcast is about, which is that the world of technology, the industry that we're in, despite what many might think, is not a value-neutral conversation and is not a value-neutral industry, that there, that there is a need to have value-driven conversations and ethics-driven conversations in the work that we do day in and day out. And the news, the newsletter, which really was, the, as I said, the foundation of the book, and the book itself is our attempt to really put out that message through the authentic voices for us which is through our traditions, through the tradition of Torah, the tradition of Judaism, but it could be in anyone's authentic voice, the same kind of idea, which is to engage in that value-driven conversation. And the corollary to that, I think, in, uh, in the other direction, you know, there are some, you know, some voices in the religious side that view technology as a threat or, you know, as something to be avoided or at least, you know, severely limited. Um, I think it's important for people to realize that technology, just like anything else in the world, is a tool, a tool that can be used for bad, but can be used for good. And it can be used to, you know, some people may feel threatened by it, but on the other hand, it can be used to promote values of goodness and kindness and justice. And that's another point that uh, the and the Torah and tech, the double, the double ampersand, which uh, implies that both are needed. Torah, you know, tech without Torah or values in general um, can go very dangerously, but also Torah without tech is missing a way of expression. Right. I, I think that, that one of the most powerful lessons that's come out of this podcast and also as I've been reading the book is, is that two-way street, that if you can accept, so let's say you're coming from a religious point of view, if you can accept that um, Torah has relevance to technology, you then must accept that technology has relevance to Torah. And if, on the other hand, you're coming at this from a technical point of view and you're just kind of curious about, you know, how could you make that relevant to, you know, religion? Like, what is that all about? If you accept that, that technology has incredible relevance to religion, it helps uh, not only as a message spreading technology, but also as a, you know, this is how you collect data and this is how you validate things. And this is how you, you know, all those wonderful things that we as IT people do. And you say, this is valid toward uh, a religious tradition, then you must accept that the religious tradition can reflect back. You know, I often think about the moment of the printing press and what the printing press did as a technology to traditional communities like our community, like the Jewish community. What it did to it was not only just uh, print books, it radicalized the availability and accessibility of knowledge across communities. And people, uh, regardless of station in life, regardless of uh, you know where they started from, had with effort could have the ability to find a book and get the education to open that book and have access to storehouses of knowledge. And of course, it began as a trickle when the printing press began, right, because the amount of books were small. But then as years went by and the the availability of books came greater and greater, I'll give you a great example of this, is if you go to a lot of uh, older synagogues from several hundred years ago in, in medieval Europe, in, and they're still around in Poland and the Ukraine and Russia, you often find that the walls are covered with the prayers, and the reason mm -hmm. why they're covered with the prayers is because no one had initially had access to books. And so they would come into synagogue and they would need to know the words of the liturgy to say. And the only way they knew what words to say was by like literally going in a 360, turning around in the synagogue to follow the walls of the, of the prayers that were covered in them. And then the printing press happened. And suddenly, over a period of time, a revolution occurred in, in, in the, the democratization of knowledge. And you could say a similar thing is happening and has happened and is currently still happening in technology of today and what it's doing. And how can we not have that double ampersand conversation of how it's impacting both Torah and how Torah is being impacted by it and how the two of them are in conversation with each other? And I can't help but think about, I mean, so it's, uh, what is it now? Is it still June? I don't know. It's like the 327th day of March, as far as I can tell. It's, uh, it's yeah, it's June. Um, June 2020. 
And uh, so, you know, COVID is a thing that's still happening. And the joke is that in January, every yeshiva in America, every yeshiva across the world would be tell families, if you have a television, it's, you know, if you have technology, it's really not okay. You need to keep technology completely out of the hands of your, of our students. We don't want their, their minds sullied by this technology. And by the end of February, every yeshiva on the planet was like, okay, so you just jump on your internet and go to Chrome and go to Google <laughs> Meet so that you can have your chavruta. <laughs> and like the pivot to technology was like instantaneous. It was just- I wish it was instantaneous. So in, I'll give you an example from our, our own lives. Uh, when our kids were in Israel, were doing uh, remote learning in their schools, which was neither remote nor learning, but an attempt at doing remote learning uh, initially was very chaotic. And the reason why it was so chaotic was uh, while our kids go to a state uh, religious uh, public school, so it's in the more modern end of the religious spectrum, it's not an ultra-Orthodox public school, it's a what we might call a modern Orthodox public school. All of the educators in the public school that teach Judaic subjects come from the other side of the road for us literally in where we live and the other side of the road is an is a beautiful city with wonderful people called Modi'in Elite and, mm. or Kiryat Sefer and Kiryat Sefer doesn't have WhatsApp doesn't have Zoom doesn't have Google Meets and so suddenly they're being told by the Misrata Chinuch by the Ministry of Education that they must do these classes over a technology they don't even know they don't have computers in their in their homes how are they supposed to do this Yet they did and they learned how. And suddenly, after a very chaotic period of time, we have, you know, essentially Haredi uh, Morot, Haredi edu ultra Orthodox educators going and conducting with professionalism, with, with, with like suave and knowing how to run a Zoom meeting with 40 Israeli kids and not be chaotic, but how do you get from A to Z? That was a bit of a, of a tumultuous period, but to watch that happen in real time was quite amazing. I, I think we're at the point where people hopefully are interested, in, but I, I wanna identify who is this book for? Like I could see that the, as I was sketching out the notes for this conversation, I thought, well, maybe it's for programmers, you know, who happen to be Jewish, who are Judaism curious. Uh, maybe it's just for, you know, you needed credibility on Twitter, so you could say author in your Twitter profile. On the other hand, I could also see you writing this book for religious people who happen to be in technology or are tech curious, or maybe it's just for your spouse to say, look, honey, this is what I've been doing with my evenings. Like, what? Who is this book for specifically? Who's your target audience? I just want to start off off the bat because it probably has to be said. Um, this book is not intended to try to convert anyone, to try to proselytize. Um, Judaism specifically does not have a, a tradition of trying to proselytize people. And we're pretty adamant about that. We do not, not only are we not trying to proselytize you, we do not want you. We believe that, you know, God accepts everyone. God puts everyone in the world for a reason. If everyone was the same, it would be boring. Except my next door neighbor. Your next door neighbor <laughs> might have to change. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, so this book is not trying to convert anyone. We're just uh, presenting one point of view of many. Um, who did we write it for? Uh, I'll admit we started off for ourselves. Um, like the project Torrent Tech, the weekly newsletter started as just like a small project for me and Ben to keep in touch. Ben ran off from like we used to we used to be coworkers. We worked together at our first job and then Ben ran off to Israel. But that was one friendship I wasn't willing to let go so quickly. So um, we started this project as a small collaboration to help us keep in touch which slowly grew, and as it grew organically, we discovered on our own who our audience was, and it seems like the answer is there's no one single answer. I mean, obviously, like you said, you know, programmers with a religion, with an interest in religion or ethical conversations, and religious people with an interest in tech, but also people who are completely not religious, um, people from all ends of the spectrum, people who are not technical, people who are not religious. We've gotten feedback from all of them, and it seems like pretty much anyone who's interested in, who believes, like Ben said, that tech is not a value neutral uh, space and who believes that values, that these conversations around values have to take place, is the intended audience for this book and for the newsletter. Yeah, 
you know, it's it's interesting how this we're finding. Well, the newsletter because the newsletter has been around for a lot longer, right? So how we're finding the newsletter has impacted people, and then and then as a addition to that or an addendum to that, as the book has been published and people are now getting a chance to sort of read the book, how it's been impacting people. And just this evening, a few minutes before we ha- are engaged in this um, wonderful conversation together, I had one of my regular chats with one of my sets of aunts and uncles who live out in the great northwest of America, the great Pacific Northwest, and they're they are not uh, the most engaged couple in traditional religious Jewish life. And by not the most engaged, I mean not engaged at all. And uh, they bought the book. uh, And I think, and I asked them, and I was correct, it was the first time they ever bought a book on Amazon in the Torah category in their entire (laughs) adult lives or, you know, lives in general from Amazon or any bookstore before the world of Amazon. And, uh, you know, I told I told my uncle, you know, the next step is you have to actually open the book after you buy the book. And he said, OK, fine, I'll get there eventually. But, you know, the the I, you know, the idea that that people are thinking this is an interesting subject. And so he's you know, he's as far from this field as one can be. He's in the medical profession. But the but this subject of technology, right, it's pervasive. And it's something a lot of people think about, and they get they get hit with it from media sources, from the news, whether it's talking about facial recognition or about uh, tracking uh, contact tracing of coronavirus patients, or uh, governments authorizing tracking of patients through smartphones. There's just a lot of that conversation happening, particularly in this moment and this time. So this book is piquing that curiosity, I think, of folks who are just kind of like, even if they're not in tech, but are curious about, you know, some of those larger questions that circulate, that are integrated in the in the world of technology. Right. And, and I, I think that we've gotten to a point where every new technology that comes in, a lot of people are having an automatic reaction of, am I okay with this? Not just, can I use this? Do I understand this? Because I think for most people, they've gotten past or they never were at a point where technology threatened them or made them feel uncomfortable. It was just a, a, a state of being. It's, it's on their phone. It's on their whatever it is. It's a tech, right? And whether we're talking about TikTok or contact tracing or password management or whatever, um, or Facebook, the question isn't, how do I use this? The question is, am I okay with this? Right. And how do I use this? There are lots and lots and lots of guides out there for how do I do this? But am I okay with this? There's not a lot of guides that speak to, should I be okay with this? And it's not an, it's not an automatic yes or no for all of humanity. Right. You have to know who you are. You have to know where you're, where you set your boundaries and that helps you identify, are you going to be the kind of person who's okay with this? For sure. And this conversation is actually what Torrent Tech is about. I like saying that, we don't offer a lot of answers in Torah and Tech, but we hope to start to start having you question. We hope to start these conversations, have, pe- have people asking these questions and discussing them and seeing for themselves what are they okay with, what are they, you know, what values do they bring to their work, and you know, what type of people do they want to bring, what type of personalities do they want to bring to their to their work to their technology. Our chapters typically end with questioning back to the reader asking the reader what they think. And we don't do that just rhetorically. We are also interested in what they actually genuinely think. And we wanted this to be a conversation. And it's actually, I think, part and parcel to our style and to the tradition that we come from, which is to answer a question with a question and to try and engage the person. And I'm not going to tell you what to think because A, there's a multiplicity of possibilities of how one could think about this. But I want you to come to what your approach to it. I want to come your answer. And I'm curious what you think. You know, just speaking personally, I'm really grateful that I work in a place where I have a manager who tolerates me answering every one of his questions with another question. (laughs) And he never gets annoyed. And he is not Jewish in any way, shape or form. (laughs) An amazing guy from England. And I think I'm the first person he's had to work with who nonstop only answers his questions with questions. And I'm grateful that he loves it. And we engage in this great discourse together. But we do the same thing in our book. We always 
leave readers with questions more than answers because it's the que what was the uh, i forget exactly who but there was a scientist who credited his it, yeah isidore um ben rabi he was a nobel prize uh winning physicist yeah, and you're just a font of knowledge i've quoted him before and he said he said i used this in a talk i gave actually in tel aviv in fact he used it in your book as well uh, oh it is in my book that's right he says you know um more than anything my mother made me made me a scientist. Uh, he said that, you know, every other kid in Brooklyn would come home and their parents would say, so did you learn anything? My mother? No, not my mother. Not my mother. What did you ask any good questions today? I, I, I've heard that quote so many times. And yet I still say to my kids every time they get home, what'd you learn today? It's like, I can't absorb it. <laughs> right. You'll get there. You'll get there. They won't get um, their Nobel Prize because of me. Because I didn't ask that question. They'll get it in their own right. Okay. Right. They'll, yeah, they'll earn it their own way. So, but that does lead me to, to an interesting question, which is, um, what are some of the comments that you've gotten back? If you, if you end every post, weekly post, and, and now every chapter in the book with a question, what are some of the interesting feedbacks that you, pieces of feedback you've gotten over time? Anything that stands out in your mind? Actually, one conversation that uh, was pretty interesting started in, uh, uh, in response to one of the issues of the, of the newsletter that was put out. Um, this one's actually, like, most newsletters, like you say, I know there are Dvar Torah, like we choose like a thought from the Parsha related to tech or from current events or whatever it is. This one I decided to have just like a stream of thought, a stream of consciousness um, about about the culpability of AI, artificial intelligence, and specifically the people who write it. Um, so let's say if I program an an artificial intelligence and it goes ahead and does some damage how responsible am i for the actions of this program that i wrote and i did it in the like sort of in the style of a talmudic discussion um there wasn't much in the way of answers just like raise different possibilities um look at you know why why it would apply why it wouldn't apply um it was more of a stream of consciousness i really hoped it made sense when i fired it off um but actually, that one was the one who got the most comments back. People like were actually engaged in that conversation. They're like, you know, people raised different possibilities, different analogies that I that I had missed. Um, it was a really enjoyable conversation. Probably about a year and a half ago, I had a conversation on a different podcast, um, the On Premise podcast, uh, which is part of Gestalt IT. And there again, there'll be links in the show notes. And uh, the conversation was about bringing your whole self to work, whether or not it's okay, whether there are certain things about ourselves that we should just leave at home, you know, as, as some people say, you know, you know what, if you've, if, if you've got this thing going on, leave it on the door, leave it at the door. And we talked about whether that was even possible. Um, and for me being part of that conversation, the, you know, the elephant, the Kipa wearing tzitzis draped elephant in the room was my Judaism. Like, can I leave my religion at the door? And what does that even look like? And at what point does does keeping a lid on it mean suppressing essential, important parts of myself? Ben, to your point, you know, it's part of our tradition to answer questions with questions. That is part of the way that we analyze ideas. It's part of the way that we debate concepts. And of course, in IT, we do that. How much of that can I leave to the side before I stop being me at all? And become either offended or uh, suppressed, not depressed, but although it could be that too. So I guess this is a two-part question. One, are you able to bring your whole selves to your job right now? Have you always been able to do that? And what was it like working on a project where that was so fully true, that doing Torah and tech allowed you to be every ounce of the programmers that you are and also every ounce of the Jews that you are? So, you know, again, have you always been able to do that? And what was it like working on this book? So I, I'll start, I guess. And I think that uh, to answer that question, it's kind of to me, it feels like a bit of walking on a tightrope. And uh, I do make an effort to bring my whole self to my work. And in some ways, I'm grateful for the unique circumstances that I'm in, which is that I happen to work in an international company with a very large R&D office in Israel. And so everyone in all the other offices across the company have become acculturated to, uh, well, Israel and Jews are not 
one and the same. That is true. That's a very important mm-hmm. statement to make. And Israeli Jews are not the same as Jews from other parts of the world. That's also true. And there's a great diversity. But nonetheless, it is people who live in places where there are no Jews at all. So who become acculturated to working with Jews. And so that's helpful. And, you know, and not only just Jews, right, Leon, but also Kippa wearing Jews, you know, observant Jews in the Tel Aviv office. And so they mm-hmm. get to interact with him. They come and visit here in the pre pre days before the Corona days. They would spend time with that and, and be attuned to the sensitivity of kosher restaurants, things like that. So that's p- part A. And part B is, yes, that's all true, but you also don't want to be harping on it all the time. And you don't want to you have to always be sensitive, a little bit of being mitzab sem, like a little bit of like, uh, yes, being there, but also pulling back a little bit and and making sure you don't take up all the space in the room. And it's all about you and your uniquenesses and sort of your your unique needs and sort of your, your your unique perspectives because it might come as a surprise you know especially you know sometimes depending on how great you're feeling about yourself other people are also unique and they also have unique perspectives and they also have <laughs> unique places they're coming from and they also want to contribute those unique things right Who would like it? and so like leaving some sp- leaving some oxygen in the room and you know again not to stereotype definitely not to stereotype or to generalize but sometimes we as a people can take up a lot of the air in the room and to, and to let others have some of the air to breathe and to speak is important. My coworkers who are listening to this podcast are probably nodding so so ferociously that they're going to get put a crick in their neck. They're going like, <laughs> to require a neck brace after they're done. <laughs> I'm in a different situation, of course. I work in the States, in New York. Um, and having been on the receiving end of workplace proselytization, and like I said, Jews specifically do not like proselytizing i try not to have specific like religious conversations at work other than with the few other religious jewish co-workers i have um of course when it comes to like things that will affect my work i'll have those conversations up front you know things like shabbat or kosher lunches or things like that so you know i'll definitely speak up and actually there's a whole chapter in the book um your guide to working with your observant coworker which I had a lot of fun writing. I wrote it when I switched teams and had to have all those conversations over again and decided that it would be helpful for others. Um, but conversations around that go beyond that, like the kind of conversations that we have in Torah and tech, that I try not to bring up at work as much as possible. And in that sense, like you said, the newsletter and then the book were a way for me to express that part of myself, which I really enjoyed. You know, there's a larger conversation to be had here as well that sort of transcends the workplace. So I just recall a couple incidents where uh, on the speaking circuit in conferences and you would get some guidelines about what to say, what not to say, how to how to speak in the most accessible ways. And all the advice overwhelmingly was incredibly on point, was incredibly helpful, and I think was necessary to make sure the space was maximally welcoming and accessible to a diversity of people from all backgrounds, except when it comes to people with religious sensibilities. And I would actually add to that religious slash cultural sensibilities, because, you know, coming again uh, from Israel, uh, there's things like, so one of the guidelines to concretize what I'm saying uh, from one conference in particular was try if you make a mistake or you're trying to avoid, say something, you should avoid something, don't use the oft-repeated term of like, God forbid. God forbid you should do that, because there might be people in the room who don't believe in God, and that could offend them to say God forbid. And so whether one is uh, religious or not, in Israel, that is one of the most common expressions amongst everyone in the country. What, even if the diehard, most ardent atheist will say, God forbid. It just, it's part of the lexicon. It's just part of the cultural sort of dichotomy. So you're trying to be as maximally welcoming as possible. But in doing so, you're not thinking about or you're not at all elevating as part of the consideration those people who come from either religious backgrounds or come from countries that are not Western European countries. And, and how to think about 
that, how to actually make space. And, you know, I heard this, by the way, from a colleague of mine, a previous former colleague of mine who comes from a very different background, you know, from a Muslim background. And she's an amazing person. And she often talked about that as well, about how, yes, maximally diverse places means there's maximally diverse or Western Europeans and, 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 you know, Northeastern Americans. And what about everyone wow. else in the world, like from North Africa or from the Middle East or from Asia, who are not Western Europeans or northeastern americans and you know what do you what do you do about that and how do you and how do you uh raise up the diversity and the ability for all people to come to the space even if they're not um german or french or british so this has been an amazing conversation there's a, a lot more i think we can go into with everything Ho- uh hopefully i'll have a chance to have you back and talk about specific chapters but before we wrap up uh one more opportunity for shameless book promotion where again now that we've heard about it and we are champing at the bit and we can't live another minute without this book in our lives where can we find it um so yeah so like i said in the beginning um you can buy it on amazon on barnes and nobles uh on your kindle on your nook on any on most other retailers um what i forgot the first time around was that if you do not live in north america um, or in a primarily english-speaking country uh, book repository i'm told by ben is the go-to and it's on there too Uh, we will have all those links in the show notes Um, and of course you can also go to torahandtech.dev to order the book and also to sign up for the newsletter so you can get a sneak preview of Volume 2, which will be coming out in about a half a year. Yes. yes. Not only can you, you ought to. You yes. should. You are encouraged to. <laughs> and if you go to torrentech.dev, you can find uh, the table of contents. So you get a sense of what's in the book. And on Amazon and the other retailers, you'll find sample chapters as well. So you can really get a fuller idea of what it's like. And that website, as Yechiel mentioned, is Book Depository, which if you're living anywhere in the world where English books are harder to come by, it's a great place to go to get your English books. You might not get them for a few months, but you can order them and eventually they get shipped to you. Thanks for making time for us this week. To hear more of Technically Religious, visit our website, technicallyreligious.com, where you can find our other episodes, leave us ideas for future discussions, and connect with us on social media. Ugh, we still need a tagline for this episode. Can we just go with buy our book? Guess that works for me.